Yes. Yes. So God, until we are in your presence and we can experience it firsthand, we've opened our hearts to you. Tell us, Lord, what you want us to know. Challenge us to grow and to be. And Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know you, let today be the day of victory. Until then, Lord, until we're in your presence, we will acknowledge you as Father God, that we will acknowledge the Holy Spirit's there, and there was a sacrifice of a son named Jesus, and I'm not ashamed. So God, we thank you for take our tithes and our offerings and all the things that we do, Lord. We pray, Lord, that it brings glory to you. In your son's name, and the church said, amen. amen. You may be seated, and kids, you can go. I think so. All right, thank you so much for the worship this morning. A little lively this morning. Exciting. I can feel the excitement of what's building for coming second weekend of June. Yeah. 20 days. 40 days. Okay. 40 days. Wow. So excited. Well, as you notice, Brian's not here this morning. Uh, yesterday morning, I understand he was at the bottom of the Grand Canyon with uh, four other guys. They're on a camping trip, and um, they'd, they'd walked down, I guess, Friday. And then Amy said that by 12 noon, they were already back at the top. I can't see. I think they, they must have had some kind of helicopter or something because that's a long hike to get that far up that quick. But it was great, to, great to, uh, uh, that he's out there. He'll be back in the middle of this week. And then I'll be, I'll be done today, basically. Uh, my sabbatical begins tomorrow. I will be gone through the month of May. And um, pray for Mary and I. We're thankful for the opportunity and pray that we'll get the needed rest we, ha we have planned to take and come back all excited and revived and ready to go and hit it again really hard. Um, if you have any issues during the next month, if you would just call Pastor Brian or one of the deacons and check with them, and they'll take care of it with, for you. I'd appreciate that. So normally I don't have a series. I do series all the time. I just finished a series on um, the departure of the Apostle Paul and, and how he shared these incredible uh, thoughts that as he was fixing to go to be with Jesus in heaven. But today I have just one Sunday, no series. So I got an opportunity to preach just one message. And there's been one thing that has been burning in my heart for some time, and I've never done this before. So today you're going to get the message on three questions that I think every single person should ask themselves. In fact, you probably have already done this, a good chance. First question is, where did we come from? Second question is, why are we here? And the third question is, where are we going? Now, there's really only two primary answers to these questions. There is the question to answer, of course, that there's a God and this God has created everything that, that's been created. And this is why we're here is because God created this world that we live in and created us. And then there's also those that believe that everything, including life, is come from random chance. There's a big bang and that sort of started the whole ball rolling, so to speak, maybe billions of years ago. And that's why. So we have basically creation or chance. So I did a little research this week. I decided to see what the latest was and where people are in the world. And I discovered that while most people believe in God still, most people believe in God, they also, most people believe in evolution. They, it's kind of, they've got feet on both sides of the fence, you might say. And so this is what I found. I found that 68% in the world believe in God. And really only a very slim margin say they're atheists, which means they say there's no God. They just believe there's not any God. They're confident of that. I don't know how you can be confident of that, but they, they say they are. 2.4%. It's kind of stayed that, stayed that way for a long time. I guess there's a bunch that's kind of in between those that, you know, they don't know, they don't care, whatever. But 68% is pretty significant, isn't it, in the world, believe in God? So they said, well, I want to make it a little bit more um, refined than that. So I decided, well, what's, what about the United States? What, what do people in our country believe? And I was kind of shocked to find that 40% of Americans still believe in creation. They believe that, that, that we are created. 
Um, that this is kind of alarming. But 73% of the adults that are under 30 believe in evolution. So there's the older generation kind of holds to the creation, but the young generation kind of letting go and believing more in the idea of evolution. So those are the basic choices. So let's, let's look, dive into this. First of all, where did we come from? Well, the Bible says very clearly, right in the very beginning, the very first chapter of the Bible says that God created us human beings after his own image. And he created us just the way we are. These, all these things we see about these different stages that, that human beings went from a, a chimpanzee to a human being. I remember Homo erectus. I don't remember all of them, but there's like six or seven of them, you know. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, no, he created us just as we are today. I think the word is homo sapiens, okay? Um, that's what the Bible says. And the Bible also says that everything else God created is basically the way it was when he first created it. So you've got your cats or your cats and your dogs or your dogs and your giraffes or your giraffes and so on and so forth, right? On the other hand, evolutionists claim that basically uh, this is their theory that there was a, a, a warm pond with certain conditions and, and this pond bubbled up into the first form of life and then it became, they think it might have become this thing called a paramecium or euglena. They're one-celled animals. They're microscopic. And then from there, it went on and on and, and it evolved all the way up till, I guess, again, human beings. I guess that's kind of how they see it. So my question is, what makes more sense? And I've thought about this, and you know, because of my background in science, I was a physics major in college, I really dig into this kind of stuff. And so this year, I've been teaching my granddaughter, Annabella, uh, science. She's in seventh grade science, and she had a book, Principles of Life, basically, or uh, it's, it was kind of like a biology, introduction to biology book. And I learned some things. I mean, it wasn't what I had when I was in seventh grade. I mean, it was like college stuff, really, that she, she was learning in this book. And I, it reminded me of how complex our bodies are. The human body is extremely complex. It has all these different things. And if just any little thing gets out of whack, we know we get sick and we have to go to the doctor and all this kind of stuff. And so I started thinking about how complex it was and all these vital systems that we have to, we call them systems. And there's not just one, there's like dozens of them. I'm just going to hit a couple of them real quick. One of them that if, if your, this stops working for you, your, your respiratory system stops working, you're dead. Okay? Just sad, sad, that's what's going to happen. You're going to die. We have to breathe. Okay? And now we have this thing called a nose, you know, in the middle of our face, and it's got these little hairs in it, kind of to filter the air as it goes in. It goes down the esophagus and into the trachea and into the bronchioles and then into the air sacs. You know, I learned all, you know, all this cool stuff. And then as, it, as the air gets in there, it, it is able to, it's able to take the oxygen out of the air. And then you have something called the circulatory system, okay? That's where your heart's pumping and you've got these arteries. I mentioned the first service, if you stretched all the arteries and veins and capillaries out in a straight line, it would be 63,000 miles long. I don't know who figured that out, but somebody did on average, but that's a lot, right? Whether it's 63,000 or 1,000, I think, wow. You have all this, this network of, and so what's happening is, you got the respiratory system pulling in the oxygen. Well, what's the oxygen going to do? It's, it's got to do something. It's got to help us. So the circulatory system in your heart pumps this blood. And I know a lot about this because of my heart surgery. It pumps this blood over into your lungs. Your lungs, something called red blood cells, collect the oxygen. And then they take it to every... I've been up here for like three minutes. It's for three times already. They've taken it from my heart all the way to my tip of my toes to my tip of my fingers. The oxygen. And that's so cool. But this is all working in, in agreement with everything, you see. And you got the white blood cells, which fight off disease and, and sickness. And you got platelets, which if you cut yourself, you don't have platelets, you're going to bleed to death. Okay? And you have plasma. And plasma is another thing that is very important. It can kind of cure all this through your system. And so you, you, you add that to the fact, well, that would be great if you just had the respiratory system and just had the structure. They're all working in conjunction together. It's awesome and, and important. But there's another one that's really important. The one I probably enjoy more than the other two is my digestive system. You have to have nutrients. You have to, so, so God's created us with these, these tongues, you know, and you've got the teeth, and you've got all this stuff, and, and it's to, to break down the food, and you've got something called saliva to kind of start breaking it down. It goes into the stomach, breaks down further, and all this stuff that I don't even want to pronounce. I mean, it's just really ridiculous stuff that goes on. And then it gets in the intestines and what you don't need, you know, what happens. That, and so it's this, this incredible design. And you, but at the same time, your digestive system would die if it had a respiratory system and a circulatory system. 
and you have a nervous system, have all these systems, and they've got to all work together just right, or you're going to be sick, or you might die. And I'm th- sitting there thinking, now, okay, there's a big bang, and wow, okay, no, no, it doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for me at all. The, the body, and then you got eyes and ears. I can see you guys. I can hear you guys. You study them by themselves. They're amazing gifts from God. And when I see the human body, and I think about that verse where the Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, I'm thinking that's, that may not be a great biological answer, but it's exactly what God did. And so for me, I look at my human body and say, it says God created me. And that's where I find. But I thought, well, what about me? What if we go down? I thought, well, maybe we could look at a cat or a skunk. Or, and we looked at all this stuff. And I, said, I, thought, I thought maybe one of the lowliest animals I could think of was a worm. You know, a worm is so basic and so simple. And I went as a kid, my first real experience with worms was putting them on the hook, you know, and they would wiggle around and I'd try to get the hook on there and I'd try to think like a fish to get them on there just right so they're wiggling just right so they would bite my hook so I'd catch the fish and all that. You think worms are just worms, right? They're pretty complex, pretty complex. In fact, I discovered in teaching this class this year that the, the little, uh, you put, you'd pick up a worm and it's got this gooey stuff on it and it's kind of yucky and all. It's called the worm has an entire body. It's, it's epidermis. It's like we have skin. Well, it's, it's the worm's skin. And what happens is actually, you ever see after rain, you know, worms kind of get out on the sidewalk and then you go by and a couple hours later the sun and they're just a little squiggly thing that's dead, you know, because they, they didn't. You know. The epidermis has to stay moist to keep them alive, but the epidermis is actually serving as their lungs. There's actually a transference going on in their bodies through their skin of the carbon dioxide being pushed out and the oxygen being brought in. It's amazing. It's a really amazing thing. By the way, here, if you want to see a a cross-section of a worm that you never saw that before, huh? Not recently. That's it right there. And so that's that outside is the epidermis part. And then there's all this, this fat stuff, kind of that's the yellow stuff there. And then you get inside the worm. And the worm's actually kind of an interesting little fella. The worm has a nervous system. Did you know that? That's why he's wriggling around on the hook and all this kind of thing. He's got a nervous system. And it's that, well, it's towards the bottom of it. And it goes all the way from the front of the worm to the back, back of the worm, a major nerve cord. And that's what causes the worm to move. And then I, I, I did know this, worms do eat. I mean, how does a little worm get to be a big worm? He's got to eat a lot, right? So what do they eat? Well, they eat the ground. They eat the soil. You know, and they got little, and I never have checked this out. There's actually a front end and a back end of a worm, you know? And he's got a little mouth in the front, and he's eating the soil as he's squirreling through there. And the the soil's going through him, and the soil has, like, uh, maybe decaying leaves or fungi or stuff, and it's growing. It's it's eating those things, and there's a digestive system giving it, and so the worm's getting from a little worm to a big worm. And I never thought about all this stuff, but all these things are working together so that we can have worms to, well, drown in your swimming pool and put on the hook, right? But then I thought, well, that's, that's pretty complex. Let's go to something that's got to be simple. Let's go to a plant, a plant. Plants are so simple, right? They got roots, they got a stem, and they got leaves. That's basically your plant, three major things. And I started thinking, well, wait a minute. If it just had roots, it couldn't do the things that it needs to do because it's got to have a stem. If it didn't have the roots, it'd be a problem. If it didn't have a leaf, and I realized all these things are just like our nervous system and our digestive system and our circulation. They have to have all these things in order to operate as well. I found out the other day we were at um, Amy's house. And Amy, by the way, you need to water that. Is she here still? Amy, still here? Is she gone? Okay. I think she had to go teach, but... She had a plant that needed water, you know, that kind of wilted like this. And I told Mary, you know, the turger pressure. It's down right now. Because there's this thing called turger pressure that you have to have in the, in the plant in order for it to, you know, hey, look at me, I'm a plant, you know. But that's just the beginning, not just those things. There's, think about how you got an oak tree, and an oak tree is 100 feet tall. And the first thing, thing is I started with a little tiny acorn like that. That's amazing in itself, the seeds of these things that get to be giants. But it's 100 feet tall. How does the water get up to the top? Do you think the leaves sort of grab the water as the rain's falling down? That's not the way it works. The tree, in order to get the water to the top of the tree, 
it collects it from the roots, it goes up through the bark and so on, and the outside of the, of, the tr- of the thing, and it goes all the way to every leaf on the tree. And if the tree, if it's been dry for a while, the leaves are all kind of wilted and so on. And then sure enough, a good rain comes along, and with an hour or two, all the trees are got their turgor pressure back up. And they're all looking great. And I think about that, and I think, how in the world did that happen? And then I did learn this when I was in probably elementary school. I probably would learn to spell it because it's a tough word. Photosynthesis. You ever heard of that word? Photosynthesis. It's actually a very complex way that plants are able to take from the sunlight and from the chlorophyll they have in them and different things. They're able to grow. And we learned that they are called producers. Plants are producers. All animals are consumers. Okay. So if we didn't, if the plants all died, we would all die. Because we have to have the producers in order to live. So God created plants and he created, put all this in perfect balance. But I look at the plant and I say, I just can't accept that it just happened. Somebody had to make that. And I think it's God. But then if, if you could accept all these things as just being random chance, I still got some questions for you. For example, where did stuff come from? Dirt. Where did dirt come from? Do you know what dirt is, right? The worms, they know what dirt is. Where did it come from? Where does um, water come from? Where does light come from? Where did where these things come from? Where did all these laws, you know, we studied the, the, these different laws that have to be certainly real refined or things don't work. Where did all them come from? Where did this stuff come from? And then the ultimate question is, where did time come from? How, you cannot continue to go backwards in eternity and ever reach today. It's impossible. Scientists and people, they know this. In order, for, the time has to have a beginning and has to be, has to be an end. That's just the, the nature of time itself. So how does, how does that, how does that work? Well, God answered the questions. He answered on the very first verse. He says, in the beginning, in the beginning what? In the beginning of time, God created the heavens and the earth. So you say, what's the big deal? Who cares whether God made this world or we're just here and it just happened? Well, it's a big deal because it's question number two. Question number two is why are we here? I'm just going to make it as simple as I can. The Bible says we are here on this earth to choose whether we will be a part of God's plan or not be a part of God's plan. The Bible says things like, All of us have sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. It says the penalty of sin is death, meaning to be separated eternally from God. Jesus told Nicodemus, he says, listen, if you want to go to heaven, in order to go to heaven, you must be born again. In other words, we are here to choose our eternal destiny. That's why we're here. And I think that makes this question the most important one of all. You see, God is the one who determines where we come from, isn't he? He's the one, the family that we were born into, we didn't have any choice in any of these things. We, the, God is the one who determines where we come from. He's also the one who's going to determine where we go. The only thing we have is why we're here, and God says, this is an opportunity I'm giving you to choose whether you're going to be with me or you're not going to be with me. That's, in essence, what, what we see here. So, let's just suppose for a minute that that's not true, Okay? That's not the reason we're here. Then I ask you, what is the reason we're here? And I think, and I think, and I try, and I, I cannot think of any reason. I can't think of any purpose. If, if the reason I'm, not, I'm here is just because I'm going to live and die, and that's it, that's not a reason. The only thing I can think of that makes any sense to me is there is a purpose for my life, and God tells me that purpose is for me to choose whether I'm going to accept Jesus or not accept Jesus. I remember that I I learned this when I I think it was in college about a lot of guys that were kind of just, I guess, I don't know if they believe in evolution, but it was just like eat, drink, and and, and be merry because tomorrow you're going to die. Might as well. Now think about this. If the Bible's not true, then there's not really a reason for our existence. And we certainly must admit we all experience good things and bad things. That's just what life throws at you. You have good things and bad things, right? And so since that happens... But there's, if we don't believe in God, then where did that, why does that happen? There's no, there's no morality for us to really 
come to because there's no God, there's no judgment, there's no one to, 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 to measure that. Lying, cheating, stealing, even killing, it doesn't really matter because we're just, it, there's no morality if there's no God. There's no law and order in all these things. And yet it's still interesting to me that most people that have no concern for God, they still want law and order. They want something to be right and something to be wrong. And many times they want to be the ones who tell you who's right and what's wrong. But on the other hand, what if there is a God who is righteous and going to judge us all on how we lived? What does it matter? Well, it matters a whole lot if there is. It matters a whole lot that if you reject his offer of eternal life, you don't go to heaven to be with him. And if you're a law-abiding citizen and you, have, you live a good life and you even respect other people, but you say, I don't trust in Jesus, I don't want to go that route, and the Bible's true and right, it matters. It matters a whole lot. It matters there's going to be a judgment day. Now, everyone needs to take seriously the claims, I think, of the Scripture, the Bible. Because if it's true, why you're here is going to have every effect to determine where you're going. Now, let me just share real quickly why I really believe the Bible is true and it's trustworthy. I, first of all, believe it's right because of creation. And I study it and I look at it, the human body, the worm, a plant, anything I look at, the stars, the sun, anything I look at, I see God. And I think everyone should. Because it says in Romans 1 that God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. In other words, God says when you see the stars in the sky or you see uh, a beautiful flower or you see life in any, any form, you should say, come to conclusion, it proves there's a God. It proves there's a God. But not only is, is the Bible trustworthy because it's right about creation, it's also right about this world. What do we find in our experience? God warned Adam and Eve. They ate from the forbidden tree that they were going to die. What happened to Adam and Eve? They died. And everybody is dying since then, right? Everyone's dying because of that, their sin. But he also has told them, you know, there's a tree. And if you eat from this tree, it's called the knowledge of good and evil. And what is our experience? My life has been filled with good things and it's been filled with bad things. I get the knowledge of both of those things. So it's right about the world. It's also right about future predictions. Do you realize that 25% of the Bible, when it was written, was prophetic? It was talking about some future event. 25%. Why did God do that? Because he wanted us to know that his word is, worth, is, is trustworthy. If he predicts all these things and then later on in history it happens, it's, it helps us to, oh, wow, the Bible is trustworthy. We have so many examples. Jesus' first coming. All the things it says about Jesus coming a thousand years before he was born. Where he's going to be born. Uh, he was going to, you know, all these different things about his first coming. Right there in the Bible. And then he came and all those things are fulfilled. We have the book of Daniel filled with all kinds of things. In fact, Daniel, they said, Daniel could not have possibly been written in 500 and something B.C. Because he predicted things that happened in 400, 300, 200, and 100 B.C. They were so accurate and so profound that he couldn't have done it. It had to be somebody later to do it. And then as they began to dig in archaeological studies, they discovered the evidence that Daniel surely was written in 500-something B.C. And then, of course, we have, I like one of my favorites is Ezekiel's dry bones because it's something that's happened almost in my lifetime. It still continues to happen. Ezekiel was a crazy prophet of God, and he had this really crazy vision about this, this valley that was filled with bones. There was a skull over here, and there was a leg bone over there, and there's a you know, alarm over here. And God says, what do you see? He says, well, I see all these dry bones all over, scattered about. And he says, he says, I want you to prophesy over them. So he prophesied over them, and all of a sudden, the skull came to the neck bone and the shoulders and the arm bone. And all of a sudden, there were skeletons laying all over this valley. It's kind of sounds like a nightmare, doesn't it? You know, well, all the things we see today is nothing that bad as that. Anyway, he says, prophesy again. He prophesied a, sec a third time. And we prophesied this time, skin and muscle and tissue, kind of like the, the, the walking dead kind of thing. So they weren't walking, okay? All these dead bodies laying over this valley. 
And then he says, I want you to prophesy one more time. He prophesied this time, and they came to life. All of a sudden, all these bodies came to life. And God said, this is what's going to happen to Israel. She scattered all over the world for a long, long time. But the day's going to come for you. She's going to return to her the promised land. And, and, and as she returns to the promised land, she will become a nation again. On May 14th, 1948, seven years before I was born, that prophecy was fulfilled. She's become a nation again. And I stand in awe saying, wow. And that's just one of so many illustrations of God's word. And then the final thing I would say is transformational change. I was reading, checking my... Uh, let me see if I can do this. Okay. I'm not proficient on these things, but I'm going to try this. You young people, give me a little bit of patience here. Um, I was looking this morning, and I came across an article in the news. And uh, her name is Kathy Ireland. Some, that might, some of you might have heard that name. She's a famous businesswoman. She used to be a model. Anyway, Kathy left the United States, went to, to Paris, France to become a model and so on. And she was so empty inside and was just so struggling. And, and, and as she was unpacking, she found that in her, her suitcase, her mother had packed a Bible. And she pulled the Bible out and she began to read it. And as she read the Bible, she, she felt like it was just speaking to her. And right there, I guess in her motel room, she prayed to receive Christ as a young, a young person. And then as she began to grow and mature and so on and everything. But anyway, she became a famous, she has a company that's got millions of, millions of dollars and so on. But this is just a, a very, uh, this is in this article that's written about her. She says, as she's reading the Bible, knowing about Jesus, she says, I was drawn to how powerful Jesus was, how loving and honoring he was of women. It gave me such comfort, and so he became my Lord and Savior the experience forever changed my life. You know what? I can raise my hand and say the experience of Jesus has changed my life. And I hope that all of you can do the same thing. Because that's the ultimate witness to how incredible, how incredible uh, the word of God is. It changes your life. So final question is, where are we going a few weeks ago, I shared this verse with you. Let me share it again. This is, um, the Bible teaches that everybody, whether you're saved or lost, is going to be raised from the dead. It says in uh, John chapter 5, where Jesus says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So where are we going? Evolution's answer is we're going back to the dirt. We're going to be going back to being dirt again. When life ends, that's the end of our short existence, whether it be 40 years or 80 years. But what I find interesting is that most people who say that they believe in evolution, they still believe in an afterlife. It's kind of like, well, I kind of, don't, I kind of like that idea. I don't like the idea of not existing anymore. How about you, right? What's interesting, though, is the Bible says that God has placed in every single person's heart eternity. Have you ever tried to think that? My mind goes crazy at this. I'm not going to exist. I'm going to stop existing. I just can't do it. I, just, I can't get there. Ephesians 3.11 says God has put eternity in our hearts. Wow, the Bible's right again. Now, I suggested a moment ago we consider if the Bible wasn't true. Now I want to consider the Bible to be true. You know, Jesus had far more to say about hell than anybody in the Bible. Why would he come and live his life and die on the cross because he says he so loved us if there wasn't something to save us from? You see, there's no do-overs. You just have this one opportunity to make your decision whether you're going to be a part of God's plan or not be a part of God's plan. So since the Bible is true, I'm convinced that once we die and we find out how true it is, it's going to be too late for those that haven't chosen in this world to answer the question, why am I here? You're here to trust in Jesus. That's why you're here. So my appeal this morning is simple. I strongly want to encourage all of you, and I know most of you have already done this, and maybe everybody's done this today. You can use what I've said today and be, use it as a witness and testimony to somebody else. Just ask them those three simple questions and begin to, to share Jesus with them. 
But I want you, I strongly encourage you to, to remember where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? And if you haven't already done that for yourself, I really encourage you to go ahead and do that. Just take all the time you need. Just encourage the claim, and claims to the Bible and see where it takes you. I hope it takes you like it did with Kathy Ireland. But I think when I, th- I ask those three questions, I don't think there's any better answers than the Bible gives of those three questions. Where did we come from? God created us fearfully and wonderfully in the image of himself. Hallelujah. I love that. Why are we here? We're here to accept or reject Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So that, question number three, where are we going? When we die, we can know that we're going to go to heaven or not. Father in heaven, I come to you. I thank you for the opportunity to share this message. It's just a simple message on the gospel, looking at it from... I guess a scientific way and looking and evaluating things. And I love the verse in Romans 1 that says, you know what? Look out and you're going to find the evidence of my existence in everything you see. And I have. And I pray for those who haven't really taken a hard look and just accepted the the words of others that don't believe. That they'll take a hard look for themselves and say, I don't want to get this one wrong. God, I thank you that, that we have this opportunity right now today to again offer an invitation for people to accept Jesus into their hearts and be saved, which we're going to do just in a moment, Lord. And Father, I thank you more than that, though, that because most of us have already done that, we have the full assurance, the absolute assurance that when we die, life goes on. But this life, the next life, is with Jesus in heaven. So Father, be with us as we we just take this moment to, to think about what you've said and what we've learned, and we just leave the results to you and the Holy Spirit. As we go ahead and sing in and respond to that song in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together, and as uh, the praise team sings, you respond as God wants.